Good morning. Let me first recapitulate some of the important things which we have learnt in the past few classes. So, <clears throat> we first considered a situation where we have an electric dipole which is essentially two metal wires two of their uh, two of which uh, align like this and uh, connected to a voltage source and we saw that if you feed a sinusoidal voltage the charged particles inside these two metal wires in this oscillate up and down you have an oscillating electric dipole and if you look at the radiation pattern at a large distance you get a sinusoidal plane wave so if you are located along the x axis at a large distance from the dipole remember the dipole is aligned along the y direction then the electric field at this point is going to be parallel to the direction of the dipole so the electric field is also going to oscillate up and down the dipole oscillates up and down the electric field is also going to oscillate up and down over here with the phase difference with the oscillation of the dipole the phase difference occurs because of the propagation time so the electric field is going to oscillate up and down and the prop oscillating electric field pattern is going to propagate forward along the x direction so at any given instant of time you have a sinusoidal electric field and the whole pattern propagates forward along the positive x direction remember the, the there is also going to be a magnetic field and the magnetic field is perpendicular to both the direction of propagation of this wave and the electric field the magnetic field also oscillates at the same phase as the electric field so the electro this is what we refer to as an electromagnetic wave the electromagnetic wave has an electric field and magnetic field both mutually perpendicular oscillating in phase and both are perpendicular to the direction in which the wave propagates now if you go to some other direction for example the one over here again you are going to have the electric the wave propagating outward from the dipole the electric field is going to be along the direction of the dipole projected normal to the line of sight so it is going to be in this direction and the magnetic field is perpendicular to both of these so this is the pattern which you get the electromagnetic field pattern which you get when you have a single dipole oscillating and then we moved over to a situation in the last class where we have two crossed dipoles so we have now got two dipoles instead of one one aligned along the y axis and another along the z axis and we were discussing the electric field pattern at a point along the x direction which is perpendicular to both of these dipoles so we were discussing the electric field at a point over here a large distance away along the x direction now the electric field here is going to be in the plane perpendicular to the line of sight so it's going to be in the plane perpendicular to the x axis and in the situation where i feed the same voltage so the amp uh, sorry if i feed in a voltage which has the same phase but different amplitudes <coughs> into these two cross dipoles then both of them are going to oscillate with the same phase so the oscillations of both the electric field along the y direction and the z direction can be represented as the same cos omega t plus k x k z minus k z in this case and you have these factors e y into j plus e z into k outside <coughs> this should be e y into z plus e z into k e y into j and e z into k outside and if you change the magnitudes of e y and e z the direction in which the electric field oscillates is going to change the direction quantified through, through this angle theta with respect to the y axis is the direction that is quantified through theta is given through tan inverse of e z by e y so if you change the ratio of the voltages the direction in which the electric field oscillates changes 
in all situations when the electric field when the voltage fed into these dipoles oscillates in the same phase the electric field is going to oscillate up and down in the line over here this the radiation is said to be linearly polarized and the angle the magnitude of the vector electric field vector and the angle at which it oscill oscillates both of them are given over here we then considered another situation so the next situation which we considered the voltage applied to the two cross dipoles had a phase difference of pi by 2 so we considered a situation where the electric field where the voltage applied to the dipole along the z direction had an extra phase of pi by 2 the magnitude of the voltages were the same so let me recap re, 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 repeat you have this voltage of the same magnitude applied to both the dipoles but there is a phase difference of pi by 2 and there is an extra phase of pi by 2 to in the z direction so again the resultant electric field is a superposition of the two electric fields produced by the two dipoles but there is an extra phase of pi by 2 along the z direction this extra phase phase so if i put in this extra phase into the cosine omega t minus kz this will become minus sin omega t minus kz and you can see that the electric field is going to go around in a circle because the cos and the sin terms are so one of them when one of them peaks the other one is going to have a value zero and then as this picks up this is going to go down so if you look at a fixed position fixed value of z you will see that the electric field goes around in a circle and in the situation where you have given an extra phase along the z direction the electric field is going to go around this way along the direction which i show over here which is shown over here and i had told you in the last class that this is referred to as being left circularly left left circular polarized so this kind of an electromagnetic wave where the electric field at any fixed position goes around in a circle is said to be circularly polarized and it could go around in two different ways depending on the phase which i have given if i have given an extra phase of pi by 2 along the z direction it goes around this way which we refer to as left circularly polarized and if it goes in the opposite direction which would occur if i were to give a phase lag of pi by 2 along the z direction the electric field would, would go around in a circle in exactly the opposite direction we refer to this as right circular polarized light so light can be the radiation the electromagnetic radiation can be circularly polarized so we have seen two situations one where the electromagnetic wave is linearly polarized the electric field oscillates up and down in a straight line and then we have circularly polarized where it goes around in a circle now let us consider a more general situation and uh, the more general situation is as follows we still have a phase difference of pi by 2 between these two dipoles the voltage applied to these two crossed dipoles still has a phase difference of pi by 2 but now the amplitude of these two voltages is different what will be the electric field pattern at a fixed point a large distance away along the x axis so at this fixed point over here a large distance away along the x axis what will the electric field look like so this is a small generalization of the circularly polarized electromagnetic wave which we have been discussing again the electric field here is a superposition of this electric field and this electric field but now they both have different amplitudes and there is a phase difference of pi by 2 so it is quite straightforward to realize that the electric field now instead of going around in a circle it is going to go around in an ellipse the elliptical motion of the electric field could either be clockwise that is left circular uh, sorry if it goes around clockwise uh, and it could be anti clockwise and if you retain the same convention as for the circularly polarized light 
you can call uh, this one where it goes around anti clockwise as right, as right circular. So, this is polarized the right circular, this is uh, left circular, left elliptical, right elliptical. So, you have elliptical polarized light. The major axis and minor axis of the ellipse, they are aligned with the y z directions in this case. Now, <coughs> you could think of an even more general situation. The more general situation is that I have voltages being applied to these dipoles whose magnitudes are arbitrary. Not only are the magnitude of the voltages arbitrary, but also the phase difference between these two voltages is also arbitrary. So, I have two different voltages and two with arbitrary phase difference could be any 30 degree, 40 degree, any angle whatsoever. So, I have two different voltages being applied to these dipoles and the phase difference between these two voltages could be arbitrary. In this situation, the electric field goes again goes around in an ellipse, but the major axis and minor axis of the ellipse are no longer aligned with the y and z directions. This is the most general situation. So, the most <coughs> general polarized state of electromagnetic wave is where I have the electric field going around in an ellipse and the ellipse is not aligned with the y or z axis which I have chosen. So, let me recapitulate again. We have considered a situation where we have two crossed dipoles and we have looked at the electromagnetic wave a large distance away along a direction perpendicular to both the dipoles. And we saw that if the voltage fed into these two dipoles which are crossed has the same phase, you are going to get linearly polarized electromagnetic waves. The electric field at any fixed point will be seen to oscillate up and down in a line. We next considered a situation where we had a phase difference of pi by 2 in the voltages being fed to the two cross dipoles. If you have a phase difference of pi by 2 in the two voltages being fed to the two dipoles which are perpendicular to each other, then at a large distance away along a direction perpendicular to both of these dipoles, you will get a circularly polarized electromagnetic wave if the amplitude of the two voltages are the same. If the amplitude of the two voltages being fed to the two dipoles are different, you will get elliptically polarized electromagnetic waves. The major axis and minor axis of the ellipse will be aligned with the y and z direction, which are the direction in which direction in which the dipoles are also aligned. Now, we then moved on to a more general situation where the magnitude of the voltages being fed to the two dipoles are different. Also, the phase difference between these two voltages could be arbitrary. In this situation, you will get elliptically polarized electromagnetic waves and the major axis and the minor axis of the ellipse will not be aligned, will not be aligned with the directions of the dipole. The major axis and minor axis will be in some arbitrary direction which one can calculate and the major axis and minor axis will not be aligned with the directions in which the dipoles are aligned, <coughs> which are the y and z axis here. So, the elliptically polarized electromagnetic wave is the most general situation, the most general polarized polarization state of an electromagnetic wave is where we have elliptically polar, where it is elliptic, elliptically polarized and the major axis and the minor axis of the ellipse are arbitrary. This is the most general polarization state of an electromagnetic wave. You should also bear in mind that <coughs> the electric field oscillates perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating and the magnetic field is perpendicular to both the electric field 
and the direction in which the wave is propagating. So, the magnetic field is perpendicular to both of these. So, in this case, the wave is propagating along the x direction. So, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the x direction, it is also in the yz plane and if and if the electromagnetic wave goes around in an ellipse, then the magnetic field also goes around in an ellipse, but the magnetic field is always perpendicular to the direction of the electric field. So, if the electric field goes around in an ellipse with a minor major and minor axis, the magnetic field will also go around in an ellipse and the major and minor axis of the magnetic field ellipse will be perpendicular to the major and minor axis of the electric field ellipse. These two are always perpendicular so the and they are in phase. So, the major axis of one will be perpendicular to the major axis of the other and both of them will be per in the y z plane. So, this is the general structure of the electromagnetic waves. Now, let me ask you a question. <coughs> Suppose we consider a bulb, the radiation coming from a bulb. For example, you could it could be the the lamps which are illuminating this room or it could be the light coming out from a torch light. Whatever, whichever situation you consider, if I ask you the question, what is what the polarization state of the electromagnetic radiation which is produced by these sources? Is it elliptically polarized or is it linearly polarized or is it circularly polarized? What kind of polarization does the light that comes out from one of the sources which we usually encounter, let us say the sun or possibly the bulb in this room or any of these sources, what kind of polarization state does it have? Now, <coughs> the, the point here is that the radiation produced by any of these natural sources of light is usually unpolarized. So, let me briefly explain to you what we mean by the radiation being unpolarized. So, if the radiation is propagating along the x direction, the fact that the electric field should be in the y z plane that is the electric field is perpendicular to the direction of the propagation of the wave is true irrespective of what kind of electromagnetic wave I have whatever be the source in vacuum if I have an electromagnetic wave in vacuum the electric field is always going to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation the electric and magnetic fields are always going to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the wave. So, even for the electric electromagnetic wave coming out from for from a bulb a torch the from the sun the electric field is always perpendicular to the direction of propagation, but the electric field does not have a well defined polarization. So, it does not the electric field if you follow its evolution as a function of time it does not trace out any well defined trajectory it randomly changes direction and the magnitude also goes around goes on changing. So, the electric field from such natural sources the direction of the electric field and its magnitude both of them actually change randomly. So, it keeps on jumping around in some kind of a random fashion and you cannot associate any of these states of polarization which we have discussed you cannot associate any of them with this kind of a behavior of the electric field. So, the natural light which we have produced by source like a bulb etcetera. <coughs> the electric field actually the direction of the electric field and its magnitude also goes around changing randomly and you have what is called unpolarized light. So, this radiation is not does not have any well defined polarized. So, it is you can refer to it as unpolarized an unpolarized electromagnetic wave the electric field keeps on jumping around randomly. And this has to do with the fact that when you have the radiation from the bulb the radiation from inside the bulb if you look at it at the microscopic level also originates from a large number of oscillating dipoles, but there are a large number of the fact that there are a large number of dipoles tells us that these and these dipoles need not be aligned with each other. So, you have a large number of dipoles inside 
all of which are randomly oriented as a consequence the radiation which comes out if it were a single dipole or if there were many dipoles all aligned together oscillating you would have a well defined polarization for the radiation that comes out but you have all these dipoles which are randomly aligned inside the bulb inside the filament of the bulb the filament which from which the radiation originates for example you have a large number of dipoles oscillating but these dipoles have no well defined direction they are randomly oriented so the light which comes out the polarization the electric field of the light which comes out keeps on jumping around randomly with time so this is what we mean by unpolarized light there are devices called polarizers which if you send this light through a polarizer it will only allow a particular polarization to pass through so if there is a, there are devices called polarizers if you send it through that it will allow only particular polarization to pass through and the resultant electric field will oscillate only up and down in a line and you can do all kinds of manipulations with it we shall discuss it later on in this course but uh, in this part of the course we just discuss what we mean by light being polarized and what are the possible states of the polarization of light and how these are related with the electromagnetic wave nature of light and we have discussed it in the more general setting of electromagnetic waves <coughs> now so having discussed so this brings us to a, a kind of a conclusion of our discussion of electromagnetic of the properties of electromagnetic waves so we have seen that electromagnetic waves are essentially electric field an oscillating electric field pattern and a, and an oscillating magnetic field pattern both of these oscillate in the direction perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating now <coughs> let us now uh, discuss the possible frequency the frequencies with which you have such electromagnetic waves so you have actually got electromagnetic waves of all possible frequencies and uh, different part so when you have electromagnetic waves of a particular frequency then you have a different name associated with that and uh, so this brings us to a discussion of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum so let us start with radio waves radio waves okay before starting a discussion of uh, radio waves we should realize that in nature and also in man made situations we have electromagnetic waves of we could have electromagnetic waves with large variety of frequencies large variety of frequencies also means a large variety of wavelengths the frequency and wavelength as we have already discussed are uh, <coughs> related lambda into nu is equal to c where c is the speed of light 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second <clears throat> and the question is that in our discussion till now this nu or lambda which are equivalent have not been specified the uh, in the discussion until now nu and lambda have not been specified and they the discussion was valid irrespective of the value of the frequency or the wavelength so the discussion was valid for all for electromagnetic waves of all frequencies or all wavelengths it was not specific to a particular frequency or to a particular wavelength now in nature or in man made situations you could have electromagnetic waves of a large variety of frequencies the frequency can span a large variety a large range and the phenomena related to a part, to different frequency ranges different frequency bands to different ranges of frequencies in this entire range are different there is also a different name given to the electromagnetic wave when it is of a part, in a particular range of frequencies or range of wavelength the phenomena associated with different values of the frequency or the wavelength are different so the names are different the phenomena associated are also different and this is what we are going to discuss here so let us start with the low frequency the lowest possible frequencies for the electromagnetic waves the 
low frequency part, so electromagnetic waves of the lowest possible frequencies that is frequencies less than 1 gigahertz. So, if I have electromagnetic radiation waves of frequencies less than 1 gigahertz, these are referred to as radio waves. <coughs> so, radio waves we have uh, encountered them I am sure uh, all of you uh, must have heard the radio sometime or the other and the AM radio transmission about which we shall study in some more some a little bit more later on as we go along. The AM amplitude modulation radio transmission is usually in hundreds of uh, kilohertz to 1 megahertz. So, maybe 800, 900 kilohertz to 1 megahertz. So, if I have uh, 3 let me let us also estimate the wavelength corresponding to this. So, the amplitude modulation transmission usually occurs at uh, around 800, 900 kilohertz to 1 megahertz. So, let us est estimate the corresponding wavelength. So, 1 megahertz means lambda is 3 into 10 to the power 8 divided by 10 to the power 6 which gives us 300 meters. So, the radio waves are typically of the order of hundreds of meters, maybe a kilometer also, kilometer to hundreds of meters and radio waves have got application as we all know in trans communication. So, the radio transmission is an important means of communication and these work at frequencies typically less than 1 gigahertz. FM transmission is at hundreds of megahertz, roughly 100 megahertz in order of hundreds of megahertz. So, does the TV, the TV also works at uh, frequencies of around hundreds of megahertz in the uh, radio part of the spectrum. <coughs> the, the next part of the spectrum from 1 gigahertz to 3 into 10 to the power 11 hertz. So, this is referred to as microwave. Now, a point which you should remember is that I am giving you names for different frequency bands. So, I'm, what I am doing is I am telling you that this frequency range to this frequency range is called something. So, here I am telling you that 1 gigahertz to 3 into 10 to the power 11 hertz is referred to as microwave. Now, you should remember that these frequency the, the, the values of the frequency limits are not very rigorous they are always quite fuzzy and uh, somebody may also refer to for example as 1.4 gigahertz as a radio wave and it would you would I mean, it would not be absolutely incorrect because these uh, boundaries are not all that rigorous or uh, I mean strict they are quite fuzzy. So, somebody could refer to something which is on the boundary as, uh, as uh, something 1.4 gigahertz also as radio waves. So, these are just some typical numbers you should bear this in mind. So, we refer to 1 gigahertz to 3 into 10 to the power 11 hertz as microwave. The corresponding wavelength is 30 centimeters to 1 millimeter. Now, <coughs> microwave and radio the higher part of the radio frequency and microwave have got a very important applications in communication. So, the earth's atmosphere is transparent from 1 centimeter to 30 meters. 1 centimeter to 30 meters just let us just go back. So, 1 centimeter is in the microwave and 30 meters. So, this microwave the largest wavelength in microwave is 30 centimeters. So, 30 meters would be in the radio. So, the radio the high frequency radio and the microwave both of these are trans the atmosphere is transparent to both of these. So, you can use it for commu space communication. So, if you wish to communicate with the satellite in outer space which is beyond the atmosphere you could use this the, the wavelength range 1 centimeter to 30 meters for such communication. Radio the radio waves larger than 30 meters are reflected by the ionosphere which is there in the upper atmosphere of the earth they are reflected back and this reflection 
prevents it from being used for communication with space for space communication, but it has important applications if you want to use this reflected wave for communicating on earth. Let me explain this point a little bit over here. The surface of the earth we know is spherical. So, if you wish to communicate from here to here, you cannot send a radio wave straight away because it would then have to go through the earth. You could build an antenna which would increase the, uh, the, the, the range where you could communicate, but still you could not be, you would not be able to communicate to a region over here with an antenna of this size. You would have to build a even higher antenna. Now, this can be overcome if you use radio waves which get reflected from the ionosphere. So, if this is the ionosphere, which reflects radio waves which are much larger than 30 centimeters. So, if 30 meters sorry. So, if you are working in the range where the wavelength is more than 30 meters, the atmosphere is not transparent. So, the radio wave will get reflected and if the radio wave gets reflected, then you can actually send trans signal here by reflecting it of the ionosphere. So, this is also useful in communication. So, before you had satellites, this was you could have communicate, communicated with the point over here from here using the reflection from the ionosphere, but now with satellites you could actually send a signal to a satellite and then the satellite could send it back. So, if you wish to communicate using satellites, you should work in this range. The larger wavelengths are reflected back by the ionosphere. Now, this range where the atmosphere is transparent to microwave and radio waves is also useful for radio astronomy. You cannot see objects beyond the atmosphere at wavelengths much larger than this and it is difficult to see it at wavelengths much smaller than this also. So, this is very suitable for radio astronomy. Now, let me just uh, divert a little and tell you a little bit about something which is very interesting in uh, radio astronomy in particular. Uh, we know uh, it is well known now that hydrogen is the most abundant known element in the universe. So, if you ask the question what is it that is most abundant then it is hydrogen in the universe and if hydrogen is neutral. So, by neutral hydrogen, uh, so neutral hydrogen we have a spectro spectroscopic notation for neutral hydrogen. Let me first introduce that. In, spe in the spectroscopic notation neutral hydrogen is denoted by H 1. So, if you have neutral, neutral hydrogen atoms it is referred to as H 1. Now, as we know hydrogen neutral hydrogen has a proton and an electron. So, if you have hydrogen in the ground state you have a proton and an electron and the electron is going around in an orbit around the proton. Now, we all know that the proton and the electron both of them have spins. So, consider a hydrogen atom in the ground state. So, this picture here shows you a hydrogen atom in the ground state you have the proton and the electron and here the spins of the two particles, the spin of the proton and the spin of the electron are both aligned. Now, you could also have a hydrogen atom in the ground state where the spin of the proton and the electron are aligned in opposite directions. Now, it turns out that the situation where the two spins are in opposite directions has a low slightly lower energy than the situation where the two spins are aligned. So, the hydrogen atom could do a transition from this energy state to this energy state. Such a transition is called a hyperfine transition and there will be a small energy difference between these two states. So, if I have a hydrogen atom in the ground state and if it goes from here to here there will be a small energy difference. This energy difference will come out in the form of electromagnetic waves and the electromagnetic waves that are emitted when the hydrogen atom goes from here to here comes out at 1420 megahertz or 1.42 gigahertz which is somewhere in the border of radio and microwave. The wavelength corresponding to this is 21 centimeters. 
So, neutral hydrogen in the ground state emits radiation at 21 centimeters through this hyperfine transition. Now, as I told you that hydrogen is the most ubiquitous element, it is there all over the universe. So, you can use this to image different parts of the universe. So, here I will show you an image made using the 21 centimeter radiation, it is it's an image of a distant galaxy. A galaxy is a collection of stars, it also has gas. So, this shows you two galaxies, the black things which you see here is where the stars in the galaxies are. We live in a galaxy like this, so there is a, this is a galaxy, the black thing is, are the stars in the galaxy and the white contours, white contours show you how the neutral hydrogen is distributed. The white contours were measured using the 21 centimeter radiation that comes out from the neutral hydrogen. How, much, how are such measurements done? So, let me show you something of particular interest to me and to us in general. This is because India now has the world's largest low frequency radio telescope called the giant meter wave radio telescope, the GMRT. This is located in a place called Narayan Gao near Pune. So, in a place called Narayan Gao near Pune, we have this radio telescope, which is the world's largest low frequency radio telescope at present. There are 30 antennas, each 45 meters in diameter. This picture shows you one of the antennas in the GMRT. The diameter of this antenna is 45 meters and there are 30 such antennas. The 30 antennas are distributed in a Y shape like this. The length of each of these arms in the Y is around 16 kilometers. So, you have this low frequency antennas. <clears throat> the antennas, each antenna is a dish. It reflects, it focuses the radiation incident on it from far away sources. It focuses it to the point over here and at this point, you have a dipole, you have actually two crossed dipoles which can measure the electro, detect the electromagnetic wave which is focused onto it. So, this is roughly how this whole thing works and uh, this uh, giant meter wave radio telescope works in a range of frequencies shown over here. The 1420 megahertz, this, these values are in megahertz, the 1420 megahertz band can be used to make images of the 21 centimeter radiation that comes from neutral hydrogen. This shows you another image made using the, G, the giant meter wave radio telescope. This is an image of a galaxy called DDO210. The black thing over here is where the stars in the galaxy are and the contours are determined from radio measurements of the 21 centimeter emission from neutral hydrogen. So, the contours show you how the hydrogen in these galaxies are uh, distributed. This uh, picture is from a paper by Begum and Chengalur who used the giant meter wave radio telescope to observe this particular galaxy. And such studies can be used to infer very interesting things about uh, these galaxies. We shall not go into it in uh, over here. Let me now <coughs> move on to another very uh, interesting uh, thing which is there in the microwave band and uh, this very interesting uh, radiation is referred to as the cosmic microwave background radiation. So, let me first uh, tell you the, briefly the history of this uh, radiation. In the 60s, when microwave radiation radio and microwave communication was being developed. Two scientists, they were essentially communication engineers at the Bell laboratories, were investigating what are the possible sources of noise in radio communication. And what they did was, they took a radio receiver and they were studying possible sources of noise in that radio receiver. 
So, you take the radio receiver and point it in different directions and see what is the noise which comes from different directions. And they found that there was a noise which there was a noise contribution which seemed to be there present there in all directions in the sky irrespective of where you point your radio receiver there was a noise contribution which seemed to be coming uniformly from all directions in the sky and this was something quite mysterious but interestingly quite unaware of this and much earlier actually a russian scientist called george gamow had predicted that our universe that the whole of space should be filled with an electromagnetic wave with with the radiation and at the time which at which this noise in this radio receiver was detected by two communication engineers at the bell labs penzias and wilson at the time when they detected this there was a group of scientists at princeton university who were trying to detect this radiation which was predicted to fill the whole universe and when they heard that penzias and wilson had discovered this kind of a noise which seems to be coming from all directions in the sky they realized that penzias and wilson had discovered a radiation which fills the whole universe so <clears throat> this radiation is uh, uh, is something which fills the whole universe and it was the discovery of this radiation that uh, uh, that is that pro pro that is, that provides uh, very significant evidence for the big bang theory of the universe okay so it's a consequence of the big bang theory of the universe that the universe should be filled with a radiation like this which permeates the whole universe and it is this radiation which was which which is being detected by this radio receiver which if you point in any arbitrary direction you get the same amount of radiation this radiation which was the penzias and wilson uh, received the nobel prize for this discovery now this radiation was also predicted to be a black body radiation and uh, this this prediction was verified roughly a little more than 10 years ago and the uh, the people who made who the person who was uh, the leader of the team which verified the black body nature of this radiation received the nobel prize in physics uh, this year in 2006 that is last year in 2006 so let me tell you a little bit now about what was the discovery what is it that was actually uh, what, what measured so this curve over here shows you the spectrum of the radiation that was uh, measured this is <coughs> for which uh, the nobel prize was given last year so now let me uh, digress a little and explain to you what we mean by a black body radiation <coughs> so i'm sure all of you would have heard of black body radiation earlier the question is what do we mean by black body radiation or rather what do we mean by a black body the word black body refers to something which absorbs whatever radiation is incident on it but it does it doesn't just keep on absorbing radiation and does and does nothing else no it absorbs whatever is whatever radiation is incident on it and it emits radiation of all wavelengths or of all frequencies with equal efficiency so this so these two properties are what define a black body let me take up an example of a black body so suppose we have a cavity this is a black body cavity we have a cavity possibly made up of some metal kind of some kind of metal and the outer wall the the cavity let me draw it like this it has a finite thickness also 
So, this is my cavity it has some kind of a uh, thickness and this cavity is brought is maintained at a temperature T. So, this T is the temperature of the cavity in Kelvin. So, I bring this cavity metal cavity to a temperature T and there is a small hole over here. So, that some radiation can go through and come out. So, we have kept this cavity at a temperature T. Now, what will happen? The question is what will happen if some radiation comes inside okay, or what happens to the radiation which is there inside this cavity. Now, the walls of this cavity emit radiation and radiation emitted from here will reach here and get absorbed and this wall will again re emit radiation of all wavelengths equally efficiently. So, any radiation which comes inside which happens to come inside will again get absorbed over here and get re emitted equally efficiently in all wavelengths. So, if you keep this cavity at a temperature T for sufficiently long the radiation which is there inside the cavity will get emitted absorbed emitted absorbed many times until finally, the radiation inside this cavity will be in thermal equilibrium with the walls of the cavity with the inner wall of the cavity. This radiation which is there inside over here some part of it will leak out which you can measure that is why we have the hole over here. So, this radiation which is there inside this cavity which we assume is in equilibrium with the walls of the cavity through repetitive absorption and re emission. So, it will get absorbed re emitted absorbed re emitted many times till finally, on the average the radiation inside does not change. So, the radiation inside this cavity in equilibrium with the cavity at a temperature T is what is called black body radiation. So, this is what is referred to as black body radiation. And since this radiation is in thermal equilibrium with this cavity at a temperature T, the spectrum of this radiation it is found is characterized is uniquely characterized by the value of the temperature and nothing else. So, the spectrum of the black body radiation is completely characterized by the temperature of the black body with which it is in equilibrium. So, the crucial point is that when radiation is in equilibrium with matter which can emit and reabsorb the radiation equally at all wavelengths. When this radiation comes to equilibrium with matter it has a black body spectrum and the spectrum is completely defined just by the temperature of the black body of the matter. So, the radiation also has the same temperature because it is in equilibrium with the matter and the spectrum of the radiation is completely specified by the value of the temperature. So, how do you quantify the spectrum? The quantity which the which quantify which you use to quantify the spectrum is as follows. Uh, I have shown it over here. You take a unit volume, take a unit volume element inside and ask the question what is the energy in the frequency in a small frequency range in this volume. So, this is what I uh, show over here. The question being asked is how much is the in for this small volume which I showed you over there what is the energy per frequency interval in the frequency interval d nu. So, if I look at a frequency nu frequency range between the two frequencies nu and nu plus d nu how much energy is there per unit volume that is what. So, d e nu is the energy per unit volume in the frequency range d nu and d e nu can be written as u nu this spectral energy density into d nu. And this so, when I talk of the spectrum of the black body radiation I am essentially referring to u nu and it has been found that u nu has this form given over here this is called the black body spectrum or the Planck function. So, this the spectrum of the black body radiation 
has a form which depends only upon the temperature. There are other constants over here which are universe, which are uh, there are other numbers over here which are constants. So, you have the Planck constant h and the Boltzmann constant k and the only parameter which depends on the nature of the which decides the spectrum is the temperature. So, if you wish to calculate the spectrum the value the energy density at any particular frequency you have to put in the value of the nu here and for a particular value of the temperature this has a unique spectrum. So, this shows you the spectrum of the black body here it is plotted as a function of the wavelength. So, you have the energy in the wavelength interval d lambda and it is plotted as a function of the wavelength. So, the point to note there are a few points very important points to note over here these black body spectrum depend the, the, the spectrum is decided only by the value of the temperature and nothing else that is the first point. The second point is that these black body spectrum curves do not intersect. If I change the temperature, I will get a different curve which does not intersect with the previous curve that is the second point. The third point is that the energy density increases continuous monotonically. If I keep on increasing the temperature, the curves get higher and higher and the peaks of the curve also shift to a smaller wavelength as I increase the temperature and it has been found that the product of the peak wavelength and the temperature of the black body the product is a constant this is called the Wien displacement law. So, it has been found that the product of lambda m into the temperature of the black body this is a constant. Lambda m refers to the wavelength where the black body spectrum peaks and T refers to the temperature of the black body. So, it has been found that as you increase the temperature the wavelength where the black body spectrum peaks keeps on getting smaller and smaller. So, the black body radiation is the radiation that arises this has is the spectrum of the radiation that arises when you have radiation in thermal equilibrium with matter. Now, <coughs> what this curve shows you is the spectrum of the radiation that you get coming from space. So, you have if you take a radio receiver and point it in any arbitrary direction you will find that there is some radiation coming which is independent of the direction in which you point your receiver it is coming from all directions in space. So, if I am sitting on the earth over here there is some radiation coming from all directions in space. This was discovered by Penzias and Wilson and they did the measurements only in a particular frequency. So, the spectrum was not very well known and if you make a measurement at only one frequency, if you make a measurement at only one frequency, if you assume it is a black body, if you make a measurement at only one wavelength of frequency, if you assume it is a black body you can get the temperature straight away because the curves do not intersect. So, the observation made by Penzias and Wilson indicated that it had a temperature of around 3 Kelvin. The black body nature was not very well known then, but later on people did more and more observations and finally, in the 1990s NASA sent a satellite called Kobe which measured the spectrum of this radiation which comes from space all comes from all directions in the sky they measured the spectrum and the spectrum was found to be a black body this is what is shown over here. So, the spectrum of this radiation which comes from all direction in space <coughs> all directions in the sky was found to be a black body with a temperature of 2.73 Kelvin and this black body which was measured by Kobe by the Kobe satellite is possibly the most precise black body curve that has ever been measured. So, what these so, what this finally tells us is that there is a black body radiation with a temperature of 7.3 Kelvin coming from all directions and we interpret this as the whole universe the whole of space the whole universe is filled with the black body radiation at a temperature of 2.73 Kelvin. So, it is as if the whole universe is inside a black body is inside a black body cavity and it is filled with the black body radiation of 
uh, at a temperature of 2.73 Kelvin. This is one of the most important discoveries which have been made and uh, this clearly uh, puts the Big Bang theory of cosmology where the universe is expanding, the universe started from a Big Bang on uh, which this validates the Big Bang theory of cosmology. Now, <coughs> let me move on to <coughs> another application, another uh, very interesting thing which has to do with microwaves. Uh, we have already discussed molecules and the vibrations of molecules. We discussed the vibrations of uh, benzene molecules. Now, molecules in addition to vibrating can also rotate and molecules have the, 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 the vibrations and rotation of molecules are actually quantized. So, corresponding to different vibrational and rotational states, you have different quantized energy levels. And if you have transitions between these energy levels, so if, if I have a molecule in an excited, vibrationally excited energy level, if it goes back to the ground state, there will be some radiation which comes out and these transitions correspond to radiation in the microwave and in the infrared. Now, water molecule, we know the water molecule, it has a hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom, it is polarized. So, if I put an external electric field, the dipole moment of the water molecule will try to align with the external electric field and if the electric field oscillates, the dipole moment will also start to oscillate and it will set, this will basically set the water molecule into rotation. So, if I have an external electric field which is rotating, which is oscillating, the, it sets the water molecule into, oscill, into rotation. This, this is another kind of ex, vib, uh, excitation of a molecule, it is a rotational excitation. These rotational excitations are quantized. So, if I have a water molecule which is rotating and if it comes down to the ground state, it will emit radiation and vice versa. So, there is a rotational transition of water molecule which occurs at 2.45 gigahertz and this is the transition that is used in microwave ovens. So, in microwave ovens, you have microwave at 2.45 gigahertz which is incident on whatever you want to heat. The water molecules inside this thing that you wish to heat will start rotating when it, this radiation falls on it and this rotational energy gets converted into the random motions of the molecules which is what we call heat. So, this is how the microwave oven works and this is an, uh, an important daily uh, day to day application of this uh, microwave. Uh, <coughs> these uh, micro, okay. Another, in, uh, so I should tell you an interesting thing which uh, follows from this. So, this is why if you put in say a dry piece of paper or something like that into a microwave oven, the oven, the microwave will not heat it. Microwave can only heat things which have uh, water in them. Okay. So, I think uh, uh, let us bring today's uh, lecture to a close here and we shall resume our discussion with uh, from here in the next class. <coughs>